Good morning, YouTubers. This is Gus Estacio from Healing X Outreach. Back at it again. As my as old Jericho Green would say, back at it again. And uh, just wanted to go ahead and uh, share a little something that I shared Sunday morning with uh, Facebook. And it came from a conversation in one of the groups that I'm in about Bill and Joan Setner's old book, Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses Who Love the Truth. Now, it's a book that I think is out of print. I think you can get it on Amazon, but it's kind of pricey. Somebody scanned it, and it's on Google. So you can read it, uh, and I think I have the link, and I'll put the link in the description below. Uh, Joan Sedner, as many of you know, I've, I've said is my godmother in the faith. And two stories from this book that I'll never forget are two Bethel stories of the Nathan Noy years when Joan and Bill served at Brooklyn Bethel during Nathan Noy years which was I would imagine in the 50s or at least the early 60s maybe but definitely in the 50s Nathan Noy was uh, president I think he was actually president pretty long I think he started his tenure in the 40s. As soon as the judge passed away, Nor took over, and he really, he made the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society into the corporate monster that it is today, and into a very successful corporate monster. He was the organizer, not the orator that Rutherford was. He was the organizer. So, um... These are two stories, really, that kind of tell you what the governing body thinks of you. And this is also the reason why I don't like big churches. I, I like smaller churches where the pastor knows your name. It's harder for the pastor to get a grasp of the congregation when it's a big church. I mean, yeah, you'll have a bunch of elders or maybe deacons and they help out with the work but there's nothing like having a one-on-one -on -one with the pastor I, I I like having a good relationship with the pastor um, so anyway the two stories are and I'm gonna start with the first which is actually the second in the book is about a young lady who came from overseas and they had flew her over to Brooklyn Bethel to serve. And back then you couldn't be married and serve at Brooklyn Bethel. Joan, I think, and Bill, I believe they got married after they left Bethel. Or towards the end of their service at Bethel. And you'll know why. I just can't remember right now. And I do have Joan Setner's story and testimony in the archives. So I'll put that below too, so that you can listen to Joan. That link will be there below. This is from, of course, my podcast days. Um, and this is why I did the podcast, was I really wanted people to become familiar with the pioneers of the faith, which is Bill and Joan and Charles Trombley and Edmund Gruss and Grace Goff. And, I mean, there's so many of them. And uh, back then, we didn't call it activism. We did protests, um, but we didn't call it activism. We called it ministry. Because unlike today where many, many exiting Jehovah's Witnesses lose their faith, back then, um, a lot of ex-Witnesses transitioned right into mainstream Christianity. And it might take a couple years, but... Uh, um, we used to have conventions. It was really nice. You know, now everybody has Facebook groups or YouTube channels. It's not the same, though. It's not the same. We st the Witnesses Now for Jesus conventions have been going on for a long time. But they're not like the way they used to be. That's all I can say. 
Anyway, so this young lady was, uh, she, they had her flo fly over, and it was very military. You know, Brooklyn Bethel back then was a lot more military than I'm sure than it is today. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is a very regimented schedule. You get up in the morning, you go to the cafeteria, you have breakfast, you have an assigned seat. You go uh, after you, you go through the daily text together as in in the Brooklyn Hall. Of course, back then they didn't have flat screens. I'm sure they use them now. And then um, you have your work, and you work for long, long hours. And uh, you go to the Kingdom Hall. You have an assigned congregation that you have to go to, and you have a small monthly stipend. Um, I don't even know if they even had as, as have it as good as they have it now. I know for I know when in the nineties the stipend was something like a hundred and twenty five dollars a month, something like that. It was nothing. That's just enough for that's barely enough for you to take the train, uh, which back then it was in Brooklyn, so you would take the train everywhere. Anyway, so um, you, you'd probably get some support from home or from your congregation for help on certain things. So she was, she was in Brooklyn, and she had a mental break. And her mental break was so egregious that she would just take off running. And they were terrified that she would possibly, you know, run, jump right out the window because she would just, just start flying. So they decided, well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to send her back. But we're going to send her back in the, in the most costly, cost-effective way that we can. So they were, more, they were more concerned about the cost of sending her back rather than her well-being. So they take, they, they put her on a train, she got all the way to the West Coast, and from there she caught a boat. And as she's on the boat, she had one of her fits, and she starts running, and she jumps right off the boat and drowns to death. So that just really shows you that they didn't really care about her. You know, for all the fear that they had about her, probably was more about liability of her killing herself on the premises. I, I, I guarantee you that's what it was. So the other story, though, is a man named Charles DeWilda, and it's a name I'll never forget. I think it's a really tragic story. It's sad. If anything, these stories really should give you great thanks for the upcoming holiday, you know. Just be thankful for the fact that you're not under the control of others who really don't care about you, that treat you like a number. That this Thanksgiving that you would be surrounded around family or friends or people that care about you. Um, but um, anyway, Charles DeWilda was a man and he was old. He had served in Bethel for many, many years. I think it was... 30 to 40 years in that in that category and he had served in Bethel all his life he never got married because of course you couldn't get married at Bethel at the time so Nathan Knorr of course changes the policy at Bethel so that people can get married and uh, he changes it. Why? Well, because Nathan Knorr found someone to get married to. And Charles the Wilder, being the old man that he is, being just a little bit, probably a little bit jealous, a little bit upset because he could have gotten married years ago when he was younger and uh, would have served at Bethel with his marriage mate if the policy allowed it. So he uh, catches Noor in the hallway and in front of people, he mentions the fact that Noor 
Of course, now the policy's changed. Now that you found a wife. And of course, that puts the president of the Watchtower Society on blast in front of people. It's an embarrassment. Well, Nor didn't take too, uh, liking too much for Charles's uh, infraction of mentioning that policy changes not because Jehovah had a decision to make, but because the president of the Watchtower Society had a decision to make for his own benefit. So what Nor does is infuriated at Charles. He gets him a table, puts him in the corner away from everyone and has everyone in Brooklyn Bethel ostracize Charles DeWilden. Well, Charles, he didn't like that too much. It was humiliating. He was isolated. And he's an old man. He has no family. And it became so unbearable, the isolation for Charles, that he left Brooklyn Bethel. And he left and he was in a halfway house for a little while, a couple of flop houses, until all of his money was gone. And then Charles was left homeless, laying on the park benches, the, the benches that they had in front of uh, Brooklyn Bethel headquarters. And I don't know if you've if you ever had the honor to visit the old Brooklyn headquarters, they do have benches. I know when, uh, when I went, they had an iron fence and the benches were on the outside of the iron fence. I don't know if they had the iron fence then. But Charles would be laying there on the bench and people in the Bethel family, Charles being a guy who had spent his lifetime at Bethel, um, felt sorry for Charles. And so they would sneak out food to Charles to make sure that he was fed. Nor didn't like that. And Nor made an edict that if anyone gets caught giving food to Charles, that old apostate, that they would be disfellowshipped on the spot. So Charles now is homeless. He's on the park bench and he has nothing to eat. Well, Charles being on that park bench and as weather changes, he died on that park bench. He froze to death on the park bench. The loving Nathan Knorr. Because his bloated ego got struck, a man had to die on a park bench. Two very tragic stories about Brooklyn Bethel. It should really give you an idea of what we left and what some of us need to leave. And not to repeat the era of falling under someone else's dominion that would call us mentally diseased, that would label us apostates, or in some cases, some of us are called dissenters because they have a difference of opinion like Charles de Wilde, that they deserve to be ostracized or shunned. Dissenters because lo and behold, should you even have a difference of opinion and even have a platform to go ahead and express it God forbid you, epoxy on you. There's nothing wrong with difference of opinion and no one should ever die for having it. 
Um, tonight, I'm going to finally, my daughter's home. <laughs> She's going to really show me how to do the live stream now, what I've been missing out. I'm going to do at 8.30 this evening my um, John 1-1 which uh, John 1 1 series, well, actually, it's going to be a series of difficult texts on the Jehovah's Witness text. And it is um, ABC, was it uh, a, <laughs> easy as ABC in 15? So uh, it's going to be a 15 minute live stream. I won't be taking any questions, but it, you, you can pose the questions. I could probably answer them on a, a later broadcast. But the whole point is to try to keep this in 15 minutes. I'm going to cover John chapter 1. Verse 1, without too much of the Greek, to make it really practical and easy for you to give a reply to Jehovah's Witnesses at the doors when they try to say Jesus is a God and why their translation says a God. So have a blessed day. Bye-bye.